I want to give some encouraging predictions for the new year. A lot of people, if you if you get online, listen to the news and read in, in certain periodicals and everything, a lot of people offer predictions at the beginning of the new year. Um, a whole lot of them. In fact, there are those that they call futurists, you know, people that, that look at trends and, and study things like that and say, and what all is going on. And, and there's some of them that, uh, for example, the, the, a few that interest me, they say that within 10 years, they, they go out within a 10-year period and say within 10 years, 90% of the cars on the road in America will be electric. That I'll charge you up. <laughs> no, uh, you know, um, and uh, and uh, they said uh, that they are going to be self-driving cars, literally cars you can just sit, uh, sit in and kind of go to sleep and <laughs> set your destination and hopefully get there. Um, and uh, a lot of modern day technology is going to be dang. They're, 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 gonna, they're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, that computers are actually going to be able to think for themselves instead of what you just put into them. Isn't that something? Now, I don't know, brother, you know, whether these things would be true. I mean, a lot of people are very, very convinced of that. There's a lot of, uh, they're, they're saying within the next 10 years that you'll be able to fly to work. They're going to have these little kind of mini uh, cars and planes, you know, where you can go on the road for a little while, hit a traffic jam, just push a button, boy, and just fly, you know? Um, and uh, I've seen people fly, but it wasn't in cars. Anyway, um, and, and, and they just some of the predictions they're making, you know, like that. One of, one of the predictions, that, and, and it's very serious about saying that with, with our ability to manipulate uh, things now, you know, artificially, that, that they're going to actually be able to, your enemies can take, say, say your president, and have the president standing before you giving a speech, and it all be a, uh, what do they call a hologram or whatever, and, and not even be that person, but you don't know because it is so convincing they can get the voice exactly the same, the looks exactly the same, and and you know that there's a, a lot of predictions out there like that, and a lot of people offer condition, predictions on the economy, on the stock market, the real estate market, what it's going to do, current trends, you know, politics, sports. Uh, somebody predicted Georgia was going to win last night, um, and even the weather. You know, depending on who you listen to, there's a lot of experts, and we know that the experts are oftentimes wrong, but, you know, according to those, we're about to uh, come into some kind of a, a, a climatic uh, apocalypse within the next 10 years or so, and that, that we're going to destroy ourselves because of climate change and all that kind of stuff, you know. And, and there's all kind of predictions. And, brethren, if you've been looking at a lot of the predictions right now, a lot of them are not good. A lot of them are not good. Those people that, that really study the, the trends and the things going on in our society, you know, they say, we, you know, this year we, we've got a horrible invasion in our country of illegals at the southern border. Uh, and, and come along with that are the, the fentanyl that are killing 300 American citizens a day and coming freely over the border and, 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 and the, uh, the crime and, the, and, and, and all of the, the things that's going on with that, the human trafficking and the, the horrible abuses and the drug cartels and everything like that. So that's going to continue. Um, in the uh, near future, at least, there are those that said that inflation is going to continue to go up as if it hadn't gone up enough as it were last year. It's going to continue to trend upward. Our government just passed a almost two trillion dollar budget. T T trillion, and 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 those that are considered the experts and uh, economists said we can't maintain that. It's it's just it's, it's not going to be able to happen. And of course that causes inflation to get worse and supply chain. And, Y'all, we could go on and on. You know what I'm trying to say. And and I, I don't mean to belabor all that stuff today other than to say we live in uncertain times. As, as Paul told Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that in the latter days difficult times are going to come. And, and we understand that, brothers and sisters. And here's the thing about these predictions, okay? Accurate predictions can be profitable, right? Well, wouldn't you like to go back 10 years ago and, and, and listen to some of the financial uh, analysts that said in, invest in this little group and this, this up-and-coming little startup business that are now these mega businesses, you know, and everything, and, and, and you'd be sitting on a pile of money and all that, you know? Accurate predictions can be profitable, and inaccurate can... Put, can uh, predictions can be harmful because, brethren, they're not right. They're not true. And anytime you follow a lie or an untruth, it can lead to bad things. And and so then we won't, you know, if, we, if we're going to go by them, um, then uh, then we need to uh, we need to try to sort through because there's a lot. There, there are a lot of predictions that people can look back at the end of the year and say, yeah, that person was right about that. There was that person was right on the money, and then others, it's just as 
wrong as it can be, you know. And and you could get a whole list. I've got a list of a whole lot of things, you know, of, of these prognosticators, you know, in the earlier time. Uh, did you know one said that America was going to absolutely run out of every drop of oil they've ever had in 1980? We're finding new reserves every day. Uh, you know, and so some some predictions are just wildly wrong, and then others are right on the money. And brethren, if we're going to follow those in this, is we want to be sure to the best of our ability to follow the accurate predictions. You know, those that have a good track record. And so I want to add my predictions this morning, and they're going to be encouraging predictions. Okay, um, um, and back, I I am confident my predictions for this year are going to be the most accurate ones you can find out there. Not because I'm arrogant, not because I'm so sure about everything, but because of the source of my prediction. I think I'm going to the right source. So I'm going to give you what I call today the prognosticator preacher's uh, profitable predictions. You young people try saying that 10 times real quick. Us old people won't even try because we lose our false teeth. Okay, the prognosticator preacher's profitable predictions. I've got nine of them for 2023. Here's the first one. The Bible will still have all the answers. Now, beloved, what you see I've done is I put up verses that, that we're not going to read today, obviously because we'd run out of time real, real short before I could get all these nine, but there are some we're going to read. So these others that we don't read are just for your note-taking, okay, because I encourage you to take those in, because there's so many we could look at. And in fact, in fact every one of these could be a, a, a series, a lesson, okay? But um, And so here, here's what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3. 16, okay? All scripture, talking about God's word, still having all the answers. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And I should have added verse 17. I don't know why I didn't, that the man of God may be adequately equipped and, and for every good work. Well, it has it. The Bible has all the answers. You know, well, Brother Green, what about this? What about that? I mean, go to the Bible, brethren. Go to God's Word. As we we said, you know, we need to. And 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 my question with each of these this year, as we talk about these, is will you learn it and love it and live it in 2023? I, I, you know, if you if you listen to the the studies that say the average person that calls himself a Christian, um, how much time they spend studying the Bible and in prayer every week, and it's pretty pitiful. And so, brethren, the Bible still has all the answers. That's where you need to go, okay? And, and, and then trust God to do what he says to do. And, and the, that, that's the number one prediction. I, I can say with great accuracy, I think that's true. Number two this morning is God will still answer the prayers of his people. Uh, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, very famously, Jesus says this, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. That's still true today as it was when Jesus first stated it on planet Earth. We need to do that. James adds, you, you have not because you ask not. Somebody says, oh, I don't have this. I don't believe it. Well, have you talked to God about it, brothers and sisters? And will you do that? Sometimes you know, a, person, a person comes to me one time and says, Brother Green, I, I, just, I just don't feel like praying at all. I said, have you talked to God about that? Do that, brethren. Pray. Sure, the devil don't want you doing any of these things. He don't want you studying God's word. He don't want you, he don't want you talking to your heavenly father and, and making the request that you need to have, you know. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 that we need to pray without ceasing. That just needs to be a regular part of our life. And so, brothers and sisters, let me ask you that as you make your New Year's resolutions, will you pray without ceasing? Will you do that? Will you be determined to spend more time in prayer? I love that song, Asking God, Hear Me. When I call, the Bible says to do that. Jeremiah said that, right? Call on me, the Lord says, and I will answer. We never get a busy signal with God. Talk to him. Beloved, we have the greatest privilege in the world. I had some young people come to me one time. One guy young come to me when we were in Augusta, Georgia, and he, he went on a tour of D.C. With a, with a singing group and everything, a choir. And he said, man, I got to meet the president, you know. And and others, have, they, they got to meet some movie stars. I actually met, met Fess Parker. For you young people, that's Daniel Boone. 
and before that, Davy Crockett, good old boy, you know. Um, you know, you, you meet these VIPs and these famous people. And, oh, you know, a guy said, I sat next to Ray Charles on an airplane one time, you know, and and uh, and and I'd say to him, you see? He'd say, no. Uh, but, but brethren, you know, all these famous people and everything, do you know, brothers and sisters, we can talk to the almighty creator of all the universe every day, any time of the day. We have that privilege. And he answers. God's still going to answer prayers in 2023. Will you take advantage of that and pray the way you should? Number three, and I and I know sometimes this one's iffy, brethren, the way our country's going. One of the trends in our country that these futurists talk about in the surveys and studies that they look at deeply show that right now in a, uh, we have the lowest church attendance in the history of our country. Used to be those that would identify as Christians or believers in God and that believed in heaven and hell were up in the 90 percentile. That's way down. The people that identify themselves as, as, as Christians is way down. That, that's a scary statistic to me. And so when I say this, when I say it with a little reservation, we will continue to worship God in freedom. There are those who don't want us to do that, quite frankly, in our country, and are very bold about saying that. But I believe for the time being that we're going to do that. And brothers and sisters in, in many parts of this world right now, people are risking, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are risking their very lives to worship God. There are people that get up today this morning and go to their church buildings, whatever it may be, how humble it may be, in some cases it's in a barn or whatever, but, but they'll go to that building and they know there's a possibility they'll be persecuted physically or killed before they get out of that worship service. And you know what? They go anyway. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 tells us this, and you're familiar with these verses. Let us consider how to stimulate or spur one another on to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Brothers and sisters, God tells us to assemble together for a purpose, and it's for us. I hope we're not arrogant enough to believe that God needs our worship. He tells us together, we're together to worship him, of course. But there's a bunch of benefits for us and the reason we need to do that. And let me say, let me say that I say it with great love and concern. I'm glad we have social media. I'm glad we have that for what we consider our shut-ins who are unable to be here due to some physical ailment. But brothers and sisters, I've talked to people that's being quite honest that said there's no reason they can't be here. But they said, preacher, I just, I just, I tell you, I got used during this COVID. I got used to being able to get up and stay in my pajamas and sit in my easy chair with a cup of coffee and watch you online and just participate that way. That's not what this says. I'm glad that's there for a need when needed. But brothers and sisters, he talks about forsaking the assembly becomes a habit. The thing is, bad habits come real easy. Good habits take discipline. It's easy. It's easy to just, and, and what happens, you know? What happens? You start missing a little bit, a little bit, just a little bit, here and there. And the devil loves that, and he takes advantage of that, and then before long you're missing more and more and more and more, and you're not here. And, and we make every excuse in the world. Beloved, we, we've just got to determine that. You know, you know who the apostle wrote this to? A persecuted people who were being, who, who literally, it, it cost them in many cases a great deal to obey that verse. We need to get back in the good habit. I understand we live in an imperfect world. And there's going to be times we cannot be here, brethren. And, I'm, and I don't mean this morning to put any kind of guilt trip on anybody that has some horrible physical ailment that keeps them from being here. I don't mean to do that. But at the same time, brethren, there's a whole lot of people that allow a lot to get in their way. And let me tell you, if you allow one or two things to get in your way, the devil will provide ten more. Amen? 
they will. I've seen that, and you've seen that. And so we will continue to worship God in freedom if we will, you see. Uh, there, there's many people that call themselves Christians that neglect this great privilege. Did you know we're one of the very few countries in the world where we can have this privilege? In some countries in this world today, it is against the law to be a Christian. And they worship God anyway. They, they obey these verses anyway. But I want us to ask, and and this is my prayer, is that we will worship our Lord as he deserves this year. And if we've been falling down in that area, that we will make this year the year that we say, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that. God deserves my worship. My brothers and sisters need me to be there so that we can encourage one another and stir one another on to love and good deeds. And, and, And we need to do that, and we can't do that when you're sitting at home. We need to do that, brethren. I pray we will. We have a great privilege. We don't need to abuse it. Number four, brethren, God will continue to pour out blessings. Amen. I mean, we could give a ton of verses from Genesis to Revelation in that regard. Uh, James 1.17, I think, kind of sums it all up when he says, For every good thing, every good thing given, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of life with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God loves us. He's going to bless us. And he blesses us evenly. He blesses us in a way that, that you know, he doesn't favor one over the other. And somebody says, well, Brother Green, I see other people get more blessings than I do. Why is that, brethren? Do you, I, mean, I mean, if God blesses us, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a very fair way, why is it that some people get more blessings than others, you know? One, so there's blessings sometimes we don't see, Right? You know what? My wife and I are blessed in ways that that other people that have bazillions of dollars are not. And so we, you know, we we, we tend to, to count all of our blessings as being material because we live in a very materialistic society. Well, I see this person over there, and he's a rank heathen. The only time he ever mentions God's name is in a cuss word. And that boy's got a big old fancy two hundred fifty thousand dollar home and drives a brand new pick 'em up truck, a Ford, of course. And 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 he and he and he just all oh, man, he just has it easy and everything so great and wonderful in his life. Here I am trying to serve the Lord, and I struggle and can't hardly pay my bills and blah. Y'all know that you you've heard it all before. And everything, and brothers and sisters, we if, if the only thing we look at as being blessed is our material blessing, then we're missing a whole bunch of it. I saw a study recently, and it was a, this 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 uh, group at a university studied people for over a 50-year period. These people uh, um, agreed from the time they got out of college until they retired to 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 sign in, and 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 they would fill out forms and papers and everything. And and some of them become very 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 successful, uh, you know, of of this study group. One of them committed suicide, but many of them become very successful. And I mean, as far as we would say, success in the world and how they were able to make tons of money and have a great career and all of this kind of stuff and everything. And and then others didn't do as quite as good financially. And this is what they found out. And it's amazing to me how people spend millions of dollars and 10, 20, or 40 years to study and come up with the same conclusion God's given us in his word. But he said, every one of these people, the ones that were truly happy, when all those folks that had tons of money, you know who were truly happy? Those who had meaningful relationships. And, they, and, and, the, and, the, and after all these years and millions of dollars, the study concluded that people that are the happiest in this world have close family close relationships. That's what our physical family and God's family ought to be all about. Amen. We have that, brethren. I have closer relationships with some of my brothers and sisters in Christ than I do my own physical family. That's what makes life meaningful. That's what makes you blessed. We are so blessed by our Heavenly Father. People say, you sing that song, count your many blessings and name you them one by one. I can't do it, brethren. I try. I run out of time. I can't name them all. Here's the question, though. Will you be grateful for his many benefits? Or will we take them for granted? Even demand them. Number five, are these pretty good predictions so far? Number five, God will remain in control. Oh, brother and sisters, we need that in times like this, don't we? 
We need to understand God's still on his throne, that Jehovah remains there, that Jehovah remains in control, the creator of it all. He says, I've got plans, you know. We need to understand that, okay? And as um, God's going to always remain in control, as Romans 8, 28 reminds us, him being in control, what does that mean for us? For God, we know that God will cause all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He's got your future planned. He's going to work it all out for you. No matter what else we have to go through in this world, remain faithful to God, and you're going to be with him in heaven one day, and you're going to look back over your life and see that everything, the good and the bad, God worked together for your good, for your for his purpose and your good. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that God is still in control. The Bible tells us in Psalms 29, 10, that uh, the Lord said as king at the flood, when God destroyed this entire world, with water, he was on his throne. And what's it say? Yes, the Lord sits as king for a million years, forever. We can take that to the bank, brethren. We can stand on that because if you're in Christ, you are a king's kid, and he's going to take care of you. Romans 8, 28 promises that. He doesn't say maybe. It's a promise. Here's the thing. Will we humbly serve our king? Will we, will we acknowledge him as our king and not just some sugar daddy in the sky that's supposed to answer our prayers when we ask for a particular selfish blessing? Will we humbly serve the king of kings and lord of lords? Not just give him lip service. Number six, the Hopewell Church of Christ, I predict, will continue to be a light to our community. That's my prayer, more than just a prediction. That's my urgent prayer. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus says there, you are the light of the world. Brethren, that's a fact, not a figure. That is an absolute fact. Jesus says you are, if you're in Christ, you are the light of this world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp, put it under a basket or a bushel, as some would say, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Okay, and so what are we to do? Let your light shine. You are the light of the world. So if you are something, what are you supposed to do? Let it do it. Let it do its job. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We need to continue to do that. Brother, let me ask you, will you let your light shine? Will you let it shine? You don't have to force it to. You are the light of the world. Just let it shine. How? In such a way that men, mankind, the world, is going to see your service, your good works, your good deeds, what you do in the name of Jesus, and they're going to glorify God because of that. We've got to let our light shine, brethren, especially in these darkened days. Number seven. Oh, I love this one. God will continue to love you in 2023. We've got all kind of verses for that, and I didn't even put down all of them. My goodness, they're, they're just saturated from Genesis to Revelation. But John 3.16 says it best, doesn't it? One verse that most of us know, right? For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his what? Only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should be saved. Brothers and sisters, and how should not perish, I should say, and have eternal life. We, my goodness, God will always love us. Dolly Parton took that song to number one twice and Whitney Houston once, I will always love you. She said she wrote it for Porter Wagner. I hope Mr. Wagner appreciated that. But we've got a God in heaven who says, I will always love you and proved it by nailing his son to a cross. So God's going to still love you, not only this year, but throughout eternity. So the question then is, will we in return love him, as the Bible says we're to do, with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? Beloved, we know he deserves no less. In our human condition, we mess up a lot. I understand that. And we don't love God to the, the, the ability we need to be able to do so in our sinful condition. But do we love him with every bit of our fiber of our being? We need to do that. And let me tell you, what are we on? Number eight, Jesus will still save the lost as they're brought to him. 
Luke 19.10, Jesus gives the reason he came to this earth. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He, that's still his mission. That's still our great commission. That's what we need to be doing. Beloved, I know. I, 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 you talking about the prognosticating preacher making predictions. I, I think I can predict very accurately that every one of us adults in this auditorium today know people who are lost. And every one of us, for many of us, those are close members in our own family and friends and neighbors and coworkers, people we grew up with, have known for years, and they're lost. I would also surmise that every one of us here know people who used to be faithful to Christ and have now fallen away and are back out in the devil's territory. I encourage, every year, I encourage the congregation to practice what the acronym is MGAM. Every man get a man. Every person get a person. Brethren, in 365 days, if every adult in this auditorium would bring one person to Christ, just one, one person in one year, we double the size of the church. Is that doable? Is that doable? Could we start there? Do we know people that need Jesus who are going to be eternally lost without him? That's our commission, brethren. And we all can do better. And I want us to encourage us to, including the preacher, I want us to encourage to make that our determination this year. And then... The last one, I can say with great certainty, heaven still awaits the faithful child of God. Jesus says that to his disciples in John 14, the first three verses. He's getting ready. He's he's trying to prepare them. He says, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going to return to heaven. And they're very disturbed about that because he's been with them. And so he tells them this, uh, do not let your heart be troubled. Why? Why, does he, why can we not let our heart be troubled in these uncertain, difficult days? Because he said, you believe in, and, and my friend said, you believe in God, but believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, some burden say mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, Jesus who cannot lie said, man, if it wasn't the case, I would tell you. But this is the case. This is what's going to be. For I go. People say, what, what did Jesus return to heaven to do? You know, I've heard people say, well, Jesus basically returned to heaven, and he's just sitting up there on the throne kind of twiddling his thumbs and, and waiting for the time to come when God says, go back to the earth for the second coming, and, and he's just kind of doing that. No, no, the Bible says he does so many things there on our behalf, brothers and sisters, and one of them is this. If I go to, and if I go uh, and prepare a place for you, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. If Jesus prepares a place in heaven for us, it's going to be good. Amen? I mean, I ain't worried about it, you know. I don't need to look over architectural plans and, and make sure the guy's doing his job the way he signs in a contract. Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. God says in Hebrews 11 that he's prepared a city for the faithful and who follow him and, and that he's gratefully or, or happily doing so. And Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, this makes sense, doesn't it? I will come and receive again. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Why would you go and prepare a, a, a marvelous mansion or building or place for somebody and then not have them come to it? You study the early history of our country. There was this great count and he come to America by himself and spent two years building this, this basically a castle for his, his beloved wife and then after two years sent for her and brought her over to the place he had prepared for her. That's what Jesus is doing, brothers and sisters, okay? He's preparing a place in heaven for us. Why? Because he's going to come back one day and when he does, if you've been faithful to him, He's going to take you to where he is so that you can be there also. And the Bible tells us you're going to be there forever. Isn't that good news? That's a good prognostication for 2023. The the, the question is, though, brethren, will we be laying up treasures in heaven? Y'all heard the the little, I don't know if you'd call it a joke or, or, or parable or whatever you know about 
fellow that goes to heaven, you know, and he's getting the grand tour by St. Peter, of course, and, and, and he's looking over all this stuff, you know, and he sees these fabulous mansions, you know, and everything. He's, oh, yeah, I know John. Yeah, boy, he, he got a nice place, and I knew Jim, and, he, and he's looking at all these, and he comes to this little old shack, and, and, and he said, man, alive, who lives there? And St. Peter says, that's your house. He said, man, I can't believe it. And St. Peter said, look, we did the best with the material you set up. Ouch. Are you, are you laying up treasures in heaven, brothers and sisters? Are you determined to be there? Are you determined to take other people with you? If the Lord should return in 2023, and I don't dare predict anything like that because the Bible says only God himself knows. But if he should return in 2023, are you going to meet him? Because let, you know what one of the other predictions is by these futures? They predict how many people they think are going to be born in this country in 2023 and how many is going to die. I think that's a pretty good prediction. There will be babies born this year, and they're going to be people die this year. Those that are going to do the latter, and we never know. If you were to go face the Lord this year, are you prepared? Are you prepared for that? If not, friend, today is the perfect day. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the perfect day to get that right. And Christian, let me close by saying this. I love this saying. I don't even know who said it. I read it a long time ago when it comes to the future. It says we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Are you walking hand in hand with the one who holds the future? Let's be determined to do so in a much better way in 2023.